talking about in metabolism, we're going to be returning to a lot of these ideas. And so this is going to be a lot about making connections as well as some of the vocabulary we're going to be using throughout this section. So for those of you that have had biology courses recently, you may find that a lot of this is stuff you've already seen before. And if so, that's fantastic. For those of you that's been longer since you had a biology course, and I'll remind you that biology is not actually a prerequisite for this course, uh, this is a great time for you to actually be like, oh, that's what these words mean. Um, so a lot of this is for those purposes. As usual, the PowerPoints have a study guide uh, to help you out and help you look at what sorts of information I expect you guys to get out of uh, these lectures. So this has, um, hey, look, the, the embedded movie worked. Yay! Uh, so example of energy consumption, looking at the E. coli flagella motors. So what's interesting with these is, is that this actually relies on the proton motive force. Uh, so if you can actually see, there's a section over here that actually shows that as protons go through a particular motor protein, it actually allows this ring to actually physically turn around. Uh, and that then allows other pieces to turn, which is actually going to allow this base part of, a, of the flagella to actually spin, which is going to allow for the rest of the movement. Uh, so when you watch these videos, that flagella basically is a really interesting piece of cellular machinery that works based on having a gradient that is having more protons on one side than on the other. Uh, and the notion that those protons then are trying to search for equilibrium and will then go down through the channel that they have access to, that motion then of the, uh, pr the protons moving through that protein then gives motion to the rest of the design. So uh, flagella motors are really interesting, really cool, and we're gonna see a variety of different things that uh, require that proton motive force uh, to work. So we do call it a proton motive force. We'll talk a little bit more about that term in a little bit. Uh, your textbook talks about metabolism being the sum of the chemical changes that convert nutrients into energy. Just realize nutrients are not technically converted into energy, but metabolism is going to allow the energy to be captured in different forms that we can then use to do work in the cell. So we're going to be using a lot of this with things like ATP as well as the proton motive force. So what we're going to be looking at are things like the, the anabolic and catabolic processes that satisfy metabolic needs of the cell. Um, so really this slide is just trying to show you what uh, a little bit of finesse on terminology is what we're looking at. So not necessarily converting nutrients, um, but allowing that energy to be changed um, and allowing that energy to, to, to be captured in different forms that are more usable. Uh, the other fun thing we like about metabolism is, is that there's a lot of similarity between these. So we are soon going to be looking at glycolysis, and glycolysis shows up in most other organisms. So this is not to say things like most other mammals, uh, this is most other organisms have a lot of these pathways. So these are surprisingly conserved, which makes them really interesting and also useful and valuable to study. Um, so there is, again, that evidence that life descended from a common ancestral form, uh, but you still get a lot of interesting metabolic diversity. So we talked a little bit um, in previous uh, months about the fact that uh, we have both essential and non-essential amino acids for humans. That being that we're far enough up on the food chain that there's some amino acids that we just can't synthesize anymore um, because we can just eat them and we can get them from our diet, whereas uh, other organisms may actually need to make those from scratch. You also really interesting things like oxygen is essential for uh, for a for uh, aerobes like us. We need to breathe oxygen, but you also have obligate anaerobes uh, that are poisoned by oxygen. So you may have heard of anaerobic organisms or anaerobic processes that don't require oxygen, but there's also obligate anaerobes, uh, that notion coming from obligation, where if they have oxygen, they will actually die. They can't live with oxygen. So you have all these interesting things with metabolism happening in really um, different circumstances. We're also going to talk a little bit about the flow of energy in the biosphere and carbon and oxygen cycles, because those are all really well related. So I know it's been a while since you had that middle school science and talked about things like the water cycle, but guess what? It's back uh, when it's time to talk about the carbon and oxygen cycles, so a little bit smaller. Um, and light energy is actually going to be really important for talking about how this whole thing works, because uh, we need light to actually make some of these work. So when we're looking at this, there's a uh, table out of your textbook talking about uh, different um, types of 
organisms. And so this is just kind of this list. So these are just good terms to know. Likely you've already seen these before, but if not, we'll go ahead and run down them. So there's phototrophs, so they're going to use light energy as a source, and chemotrophs are using chemical compounds as energy sources. So under that umbrella, we have both chemoorganotrophs and chemolithotrophs. So either ones are using organic compounds or ones are using inorganic compounds. These crop up in some really interesting places. Uh, so you sometimes have weird ones happen uh, in things like the hydrothermal vents uh, or really interesting specific locations. Uh, autotrophs are going to use carbon dioxide as a carbon source and heterotrophs are going to use organic compounds as a carbon source. So as you might have figured out, autotrophs are going to be things like plants, um, many source of algae, things like that. Heterotrophs will be uh, organisms that eat other organisms often. Um, and the chemolithotrophs are going to be especially those ones that are usually uh, almost always autotrophs. So you can do have some really interesting situations of different organisms using uh, unlikely sources. Uh, so as far as the sun, the sun is energy for life. It's impossible to do this without talking about the sun, uh, which is that phototrophs are going to use light to drive that synthesis of organic molecules. So we often take it for granted that we get to eat plants um, and that plants do utilize that sunlight. If you haven't actually taken a look at that, you should look at some of the solar uh, panel research that's being done because plants just do it automatically and humans have been trying to replicate how good plants are at absorbing the sun's light and turning that into energy for quite a while. So heterotrophs basically then use this as building blocks. We're going to recycle a lot of the carbon dioxide, oxygen, and water. Um, and you're going to see that flow of energy uh, coupled to both carbon and oxygen. So we're going to have things like our photoautotrophic cells that are going to go ahead and make glucose. So they're going to take in carbon dioxide into themselves. Solar energy is going to help these uh, photoautotrophic cells take the carbon dioxide and make glucose which then is going to be utilized by the heterotrophic cells. And then we're going to uh, undergo it through respiration and then get carbon dioxide. In a similar way, as the photoautotrophic cells are making glucose, oxygen is a byproduct of that, which our heterotrophic cells are going to use. Uh, and then oftentimes water is going to be a byproduct of that. So you have this lovely cycle going around. Again, this is mostly just to think about this happening on a much smaller scale. You've likely seen things like this before when we talk about things like ecosystems or other broader scope uh, things. This is just to talk about it relating back to small biochemical processes. Metabolic maps. Uh, I love metabolic maps. I think they're really fun. I think they're really neat. I know when you look at that, there's just so much stuff there, but honestly, these are fun. So when you look at these, realize that there's a, that they're basically trying to show you all of the metabolism happening in a cell. It's kind of ridiculous, uh, but it's also really neat in the fact that you can literally get a bird's eyed view of this. So just looking at this big map, uh, while we haven't talked about it yet, glycolysis is going to be a major pathway and you can actually see glycolysis here. It's highlighted in pink. This is then going to come down uh, and go into the citric acid cycle, which is down in here and eventually going to be making ATP. Um, in the mitochondria within ATP synthase and the proton motor force down here. Uh, you can actually also see the little sunshine symbol. Uh, and this is actually photosynthesis. This uh, compartment over here is supposed to be for a chloroplast. So this is not necessarily for uh, our bodies, but it's just a general metabolic map. There's also, if in case you wanted to play with it, uh, there's a link here and I already have it brought up on my computer. Uh, of the of this interactive map. So there's a the chloroplast uh, like I was talking about before and you can actually zoom in and out of this thing. So it is the same one that is on um, the PowerPoint slides, uh, but like there's folic acid and what all that goes into. And here is that lovely pink highlighted part. So here is our glucose that can come into the cell and we can then see it go into glycolysis, which we'll be talking about very soon, but it can go to other places as well. So you can also have glucose be made into uh, sorbitol over here. And what you can see is that in this particular map, there's all of these little numbers. And if you'll remember back, these are then showing you the enzymes. So remember there was that four number system to describe enzymes by class and all of its different delineations. And so here they actually have all the metabolites written out, but then that number code system for the enzymes themselves. 
So that's just in there for fun uh, to, to look at because I just love it. You can also actually look at a metabolic map in a slightly uh, simple, simpler, uh, streamlined way. And what you can actually do with this is it's going to be a dot connected to a line and the dot's going to represent a nutrient and you're going to then see this line be in an enzyme. So when you look at this, um, which is on this page then, uh, you have essentially that same general idea, but then realize that every line here is supposed to be an enzyme. Every dot is supposed to be some sort of nutrient or some sort of middle thing. Uh, and what's kind of fun is with this one, you can actually see how many connections other things have. Uh, so in this case, pyruvate is actually what is circled in red. And so pyruvate then is one that's got a lot of different connections to it. It's kind of a central hub of a molecule. Uh, but you can kind of see that there's multiple places where that occurs. And sometimes you can actually see dots that are all by themselves that don't connect to anything else. So it's really interesting to kind of see how things are connected to one another. So metabolic maps are really useful for getting that bird's eye view uh, and just nice to be like, all right, so what else does this connect to? Uh, also, for those of you that are interested in diseases, this also helps you give a general idea of why sometimes something is such a big deal when one part of uh, an enzyme or one part of a metabolic map doesn't work like it's supposed to. Because sometimes you're like, oh, well, we'll just fix this one tiny little part. And sometimes that works. Sometimes you can fix that one tiny little part. And other times it's so interwoven to the rest of the whole that it's either going to be lethal to the, that, that change might be lethal to the cell um, or it's going to have catastrophic um, issues with it. So this also helps give you that notion that you've got a lot of interconnections at play.